Senate Director, Representative Prescott, members of the committee, good afternoon. I'm Pam Schaefer. I'm a retired engineer and business development manager from Brunswick. I've been following news regarding the Maine State Housing Authority, which I'll pronounce Misha, I guess, from here on out, as much as I dislike that. And have attended the last three Board of Commissioners meetings <coughs> at their offices. I'm here to speak in support of this bill. Misha, in his press release, states the following. Maine Housing, a quasi-governmental agency, is a $1.6 billion financial institution that serves 90,000 people annually and infuses approximately $1.2 million into Maine's economy daily. $1.2 million daily equates to $440 million a year. By comparison, the Maine Turnpike Authority runs on about $110 million a year. So by at least one measure, Misha is four times the size of the Turnpike Authority. Furthermore, Misha is part of an industry, as I think of it, with specialized developers and operators who depend on it as a customer. In engineering terms, Misha is an open-loop system with no substantial feedback. Those familiar with this terminology know that such systems can become unpredictable and unstable, and in the worst case, exhibit runaway behavior. Clearly, a government operation of this scale, quasi or otherwise, should not operate without oversight and accountability, which it has been doing since inception. Or definition, when examined closely, reveals minimal control and authority over operations. The scale of Misha operations is simply too great to permit it to function without significant checks and balances. There are too many opportunities and temptations for using other people's money to promote agendas in the name of the public good, and taxpayer funds on this scale should not be granted to an autonomous authority for disposition. Proclaiming a need to avoid political influence is nonsensical on its face. Misha is solely and strictly a government authority, created by government, funded by government via taxpayer funds, and operating according to a bewildering array of government regulations and mandates. Its director is appointed by a governor, as are the commissioners on its board. The current director is a former state treasurer, legislator, and candidate for Congress. A prior director was a longtime state legislator, later, Senate President, and recently a candidate for governor. In other words, Misha exists only because of politics and entirely in the political sphere. To suggest otherwise is illogical. Claims of pure intentions and a facade of public service are not good enough to assure effectiveness and respect for what should be core principles. The proof of that is everywhere. Repeated claims of self-importance only add to the impression that perspective has been lost. And the more secure one becomes in their position, and the less oversight and accountability one is subject to, the less incentive there is to adhere to and prioritize the core mission. Extravagance and mission creep become irresistible. There should only be one mission, providing affordable housing for the most needy, fulfilling green agendas, preserving historic buildings, and the like are irrelevant if the priority is serving the need. Cost control should be paramount, not only once a development starts, but in planning those developments and conducting competitions to build and operate them. Truthfully, the, using the term affordable in the Misha context is grossly misleading, if not offensive. By any number of measures, recent projects have been anything but affordable, at least to taxpayers. The only party for whom housing is affordable is the client who is being subsidized by taxpayers. This is not affordability any more than a free lunch is free. Calling these projects government subsidized would be a major step forward in being honest and transparent. Apparently, though, political correctness trumps honesty. As a final note, it's ironic that while Misha opposes anything that would increase oversight of their operations, they are intent on intense oversight of those who would attend their supposedly public meetings. One has far easier access to the State House than they do Misha. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Are there questions of Mr. Schaefer? 
Representative Driscoll. Thank you, sir, for the record. Let me respond to that specifically, if, if I might. Um, there were specific cases pointed out at one of the first board meetings I went to of, of developments in Portland in historic buildings by private parties, very nicely appointed apartments, you can find them on the web, that were being done for something in the range of $100,000 less than similar items being done through Misha. Specifically with respect to the Green Agenda, and I'm just reporting what I heard at the board meetings now, all right? Uh, in one case, a solar heating, water heating system was, was used that runs $7,500. And one of the directors who has been there well before this administration said she researched it and discovered that the system had a 50-year payback and let, would only last for 20 years. I took that as, as something that was counter to the notion of being cost effective. Now, when it's a director who's been there for years who made that quote, I didn't choose to track it down, but that's the source of my comment. Okay? So I think there are, there are probably many examples. I mean, if you look at the cylinders of the world and so on, you know, energy efficiency is a nice idea, but it's also a big sinkhole for money, and unless that is managed, prudently and with an eye towards what the primary mission is, it quickly becomes kind of a flag to wave, but it's not of much use. Okay. Well, I appreciate your specific references. <coughs> I don't live in Portland, however, I went probably since you read the paper. Uh, however, you know, in the economy that we're in, I would remind committee members that this is a time for questions, not for commentary. We'll have commentary time when we have our when we have our uh, when we have our work session, and also I would remind folks that uh, this is about governance of the organization. Uh, and with that, I thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, another question, Representative Prescott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Thank you for being here. A um, little troubled by the last paragraph um, about the supposedly public meetings. And I see that you've attended three, the last three commission yes. meetings. Yes. Um, can you please share your experience there? Because I'm, I'm troubled by the word supposedly public. Well, at, at the first one I went to, I was, I think I was the first one to arrive, judging from the sign-up sheet. Um, I was there a half hour ahead of time. And there was a sign-up sheet, and I signed up, signed in, and I thought, well, I'll just go up to the meeting, and take a, or to the meeting room, and take a seat. So it was made very clear, clear, very quickly that no, we would have to stay in the waiting area, and we would be escorted up. Now it turns out that that rule only applied to quote members of the public, not to members of the media, etc. So several of us, I think Mr. Colby, I think you waited with me, and Mrs. Adams, you waited with me. I think there were probably half a dozen of us down there. And we were, when we were finally escorted up, the meeting was already underway. All right? 
Now, the second reading, I'm trying to, that one doesn't stand out in my mind, but in the most recent one, they put up a barrier across, do you have any idea what the lobby area looks like? You, you do? You know, there's sort of a glassed in, uh, sort of a receptionist area there. And they put up one of these things that looks like an airline, kind of a line control tape that spanned all the way across halfway through the room so that you could not get to the elevator and there was room for one person. And when I went to sign up on the sign up list, the gentleman who was there who I had not seen before, who apparently worked for me, she said, he said, oh, I'll take care of that. And he, and he sort of took it out of my hand and he asked who I was. And I told him and he said, well, why are you here? And I said, I'm a member of the public. I'm coming for the board meeting. And, and we had a little exchange back and forth on that, but then he said, well, you'll have to wait over here in the waiting area. You'll be escorted up. And, um, and then an individual um, who works for Misha came down a few moments later to escort a press person up and said, and waved to me to say, come on, I'll bring you up too. So they have a very sort of controlled access view, at least for the board of directors meetings. The second one, while there might not have been any standout incidents, it's a matter of you need to be escorted up to the conference room. Now, you know, I used to work in the defense business. I know what being escorted in, in secure facilities is. But there are, no, there are no secure information and security clearances involved here. This is strictly a matter of how much access you provide. You saw me, I could come right in this door today and walk right into this room. I can, walk in, I can walk into the governor's suite without having to go through anything first. Now, I'm not going to see the governor, but I can certainly walk in and talk to uh, someone. Have so. you been there recently? <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't been there in a few months. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, does that give you enough information? Yes. And Next. Uh, uh, another question? Oh, excuse me. Uh, Senator Jackson. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just say, I think last week or the week before, we got a pretty intense security there now, so. Well, I know you've got the metal detector, right? Um, but uh, my question was, uh, I was curious as to when you went to those meetings, like the first one, what was the date? Was it the last couple of weeks? It was, it was the November meeting. I've been to the last three in a row, whatever the dates were in November. It's usually the third Tuesday, right? Well, yeah, and so the December one, I think, was December 20th. And the January one, they moved to a Friday because the commission was going to make it. I'll be happy to send you those things, but it's the last three meetings. And they're monthly. Right. And do and you know, like, had you asked? I mean, is that the way it was all was done? Or, is, is, you know, I had no it? idea, and I did not ask. The uh, I'll tell you, at the first meeting, I think it was the first one. The lady who was doing the escorting acted almost as if you were threatening her if you asked a question, right? Um, and at one point, she actually said if, if it kept up, that she would be calling the police. Oh, is that what we go? And, and so this is like, why can't I go up? Well, because you can't. Now, this is not me speaking. I'm watching what went on, and there are other people here who were there. But, but the notion was you were being belligerent if you were to have to go up to the meeting room until they, until they were ready to take you up. And as I said, that particular time, they took us up after the meeting had already begun. Representative Presley, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I'll just follow up for the work session. I, mean, I know how things work here in this room as far as public hearings go and, and our meeting process. And is there anything in, in the statute that governs the Maine State Housing Authority to run their meetings in such a way that I'd be curious to see exactly what kind of protocol they are required to have and, and if they're violating anything there. What um, session, thank you. I think that's a question for our analysts. Oh, for okay. I was going to say, I mean, I've reviewed the statute, and provide. it's a bewildering yeah. list, uh, but I don't recall anything about how you run your meeting. Yeah. Thank you. Question. Seeing none. Next up is Mary Adams. Welcome, Ms. Adams. Um, 
Chairman Director and Chairwoman Prescott and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Mary Adams. I live in Garland and I came to Augusta today to speak in favor of LD 1778. As an aside, the uh, interstate was reducing um, speed to 45 with a sign that said ice and snow, which may have had something to do with the attendance today. I felt very brave that I continued on. Maybe the wish was a challenge. I'm here. <laughs> um, I've got happy news. This is going to be a short presentation, and I've got some great information. And just so you know, Ms. Adams, I see you refer to the uh, EBW Associates uh, um, uh, review, and we all received copies of that along with, uh, with uh, Senator Courtney's testimony earlier. So we Terrific. all have copies of that. That's wonderful. Um, um, I recommend to you the report from 2004 by EBW Associates, commissioned by the Southern Maine Affordable Rental Housing Coalition, described as an ad hoc group formed in 2000 for the purpose of increasing the supply of affordable rental housing in Southern Maine. The 2004 report is titled, Bringing Housing Front and Center, a review of the Maine State Housing Authority. I think it should be the cornerstone of your deliberations on this bill because the report does your homework for you, I thought. <laughs> the executive summary is only 10 pages and it is a revealing comparison of Maine State Housing with similar housing authorities. They're called HFAs or Housing Finance Agencies around the country. One of the criteria compared is governance. I've attached the last two pages of the summary, which are the um, seven and eight conclusions reached by the review. Uh, excuse me, they are the eight conclusions reached by the review. Number seven and eight addresses this bill head on and why the legislature never did anything about the cockamamie set set up after reading this is beyond my comprehension. Actually, let me just interrupt and say that the uh, that the director no longer serves as chairman of the board. There was a separate chairman, so they did take some action apparently. Oh, they, okay, they, but not enough, apparently. Uh, Maine is the only state to use and tolerate this twisted director-centered center, aberration of centralized control. I'm reminded of Alice in Wonderland when looking at the unrestrained power of the director with all power of the agency vested in one unelected person. The governance structure is suitable for a Mad Hatter's Tea Party, but not for an agency with assets of over a billion and a half dollars entrusted with a mission of affordable housing for Maine people. From the report's conclusion, I've taken just a couple of sentences. Number seven, Maine is the only state in which the director serves as the chairman of the agency's board of directors. And as I said, that's not correct any longer. That is not correct any longer. Right. It was at the time the report was, uh, was written. Okay. And, and how was that changed? Uh, it was changed so there so that the uh, board, I believe, elects a member of the uh, of the board as chair, and we'll uh, ask our yes. we'll have a representative from Maine Housing who will be speaking later, and we'll have them uh, uh, answer that question. Okay, um, um, and in 38 other states, the executive director is appointed by the board because the board of commissions is chaired by the director, does not have the power to hire and fire the director, which is, um, you say has been changed, and because the powers of the board are limited to those specifically spelled out in the enabling legislation, the board does not exercise authority over the agency. And I believe that's still true. Those eight um, very limited roles that the uh, um, Board of Commissioners has as a task, I don't even think it would be worth driving to Augusta for. Um, in fact, I'm amazed they've been able to find people to sit there like Taylor's dummies and just not function. I, I'm amazed. I don't, I don't know why they did it. Um, among other things, this, this results in a lack of agency oversight and the absence of a forum for appeal of agency decisions. 
Um, I've, I brought with me a copy of the Garland Town Report just as a reminder of the accountability demanded by local people from their local government. And LD 1718 will give this state level agency a much needed dose of oversight and local board control, it seems to me. I urge a unanimous ought to pass and a fast track to enactment. The agency appears in deep trouble and needs this correction. Thank you for your time. And at the bottom of my, um, my testimony, I've given the link to that report. I thought it was very, very helpful to put Maine State Housing in context of other such agencies across the country. So I was glad that they did it. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, thank you, Ms. Adams. Are there questions to Ms. Adams? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Next up is Rick McCarthy. Thank you very much. I didn't see a place to sign it. We are just keeping track of the list and taking you in order here, so we're okay. Thank you, Mary. If you're not on that list, after I've gone through the list, I will call for, well, after I've gone through this list, my guess is I'm going to be uh, having opponents speak because we'll have gone through an hour of testimony and then we'll move back to proponents and you'll have an opportunity to come forward. No worries. Everyone who's here wants to have a chance to speak, will have a chance to speak. Senator, I just one uh, detail. You notice I'm here to testify either for or against the bill. You didn't have a separate Oh, I didn't, I didn't see that, Mr. So McCarthy. So I think, uh, your pleasure. You know, I'm going to follow tradition and let you speak later, if you don't mind. Yeah, Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. So, that said, I'm going to have uh, Carol Weston, the former senator from Waldo County, come forward. Former colleague of mine. Thank you, Carol. For being Thank you Welcome. very much, and good afternoon, um, Chairman Rector and Chairwoman Prescott and esteemed members of the new Labor, Commerce, and Economic Development, Economic Development Committee. I am Carol Weston, the Main State Director for Americans for Prosperity, and I'm pleased to be here to discuss a very important issue with you this afternoon. An act relating to the govern governance of the Main State Housing Authority is before you as LD 1778, and I'm here to recommend passage of this bill. In a perfect world, Every bill that is brought before a legislative committee would solve a real problem. And only after exhausting all other fixes would the passage of legislation be necessary. In LD 1778, you have a necessary solution to a real problem. The problem? How to match the authority over billions of taxpayer dollars with accountability. The solution is to make sure that people who have discretion over spending someone else's money also are held accountable to the people who are giving up that money. You as legislators have discretion over the entire state budget you are also accountable to the voters in your districts. Every commissioner serves at the pleasure of the governor, who in turn is accountable to those very same voters. In Maine, we have several quasi-governmental entities, but it appears that only one has no direct link of accountability to the people paying the bill, and that is the Maine State Housing Authority. The thing about being a former legislator is you have a memory. And one came to me as I was working on this testimony. And those of you who served, and I see there are some here, who served in the 119th legislature might remember a bill that was entitled, An Act to Improve Oversight and Accountability of Student Loan Programs Funded with an allocation of the state ceiling on private activity tax-exempt bonds. Now that's a mouthful, but what it was, a private entity who had the ability to use state bonding was going before this legislature. In fact, this was a committee bill that came from then uh, Senate Democratic Chair Carol Contos, 
This bill was to have more oversight and accountability of a group much, much smaller than Maine State Housing Authority and with much, much less money in its care. The need they saw was real, they acted upon it, and that bill is now law. The need that they were addressing is here today in the form of the Maine State Housing Authority. Though no public administrator would relish negative public scrutiny, every public administrator should encourage transparent accountability. And let me mention, just yesterday, I um, discovered that Maine is not alone. Our neighbor in Massachusetts, Governor Patrick uh, Deval Patrick, has just mandated new measures to make housing authorities in Massachusetts more transparent and more accountable. And, not in Massachusetts, but in Saratoga Springs, they have a bed bug problem in one of their income, uh, low income housing uh, districts. And they um, discovered through some investigation that the money spent by the commissioners and the director of the housing authority there would have covered the entire amount needed to eradicate bed bugs. So there's an ongoing investigation saying the funds need to go where the need is. So Maine is certainly not alone. You have a chance to ensure that the current and future executive directors of the Maine State Housing Authority work under a process of accountability and transparency, and I believe they would thank you for that. That process is before you in LD 1778. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Senator Weston. Are there questions? Uh, Representative Newman back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do you know how this problem originally uh, occurred? Was the original bill of black? <coughs> The details, or is the bill that I just that used as an example, sir? No, the bill that were 1778. Why is it the directors have no authority over the executive director? When did that happen? How did it happen? I believe, and someone else will have to answer that, but I believe, um, I believe someone else will answer that. <laughs> um, it is just non existent, and what um, anyone who has ever served as uh, an executive director or been in a job that's responsible for other people's money, I believe would welcome this type of transparency and accountability. Representative Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, they are responsible for lots and lots of money, but with that money comes auditing from several forms every year. And sir, uh, Representative Hunt, right. once that audit is done, um, then if there is fraud, then the governor can remove the director. But, but the auditing hasn't found fraud. No, I'm not saying they did. But what I'm saying is that is the only accountability. And I believe that anyone would want more than waiting to you commit fraud before you can be removed from office. It seems like there's a lot of auditing already. But I did put in a formal question to get to the question. Representative Driscoll. Thank you, Senator Wright. Good afternoon, former Senator. I'm just wondering what the relationship of the attempted eradication of bed bugs in Sarasota, Florida, has to do with anything that's going on. There. Oh, perhaps I didn't explain myself. I, I didn't it was understand. a matter of it was a matter of the decision to use taxpayer funds, <clears throat> not for the people that this housing authority was to serve, but to send their staff and executive director on trips and not address the issue that they are responsible for in Saratoga Springs, which is the bed bug issue in some of the houses that they um, have contract to rent. Any other questions for the committee? Seeing none, thank you. Senator Westman. 